Okay. All right. All right. We're, we're walking here. Let's meet our panelists. He is a columnist for The Guardian, author of the forthcoming book, The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus, and the Fall of New York, Ross Barkan. We're excited to be on the panel and to talk about the horrible dysfunction of uh, New York politics. So it's a passion project of mine. Well, no spoilers. We'll get to it. Uh, second up, last time he was on the show, he was a candidate... And he is now the assembly member for New York's 36th district, Zoran Mamdani. Hello. Thank you so much for having me back, Virgil and Free. It's a pleasure. And rounding things out, she is a tenant organizer, urban planner, campaign coordinator for Housing Justice for All, and she helps run housing campaigns for NYC DSA, Seal Weaver. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. It's been in interesting past few weeks here in big apple politics here in the city where we're all here in new york except for brie who continues to be in temporary exile <laughs> but she is a new yorker just like the rest of us <laughs> and you know there's there's a lot going on we are two months out from the democratic primary for the mayoralty of new york and maybe maybe we should start there because there's been you know, the refrain that I hear a lot is, you know, ignore the polls right now. This race will not matter until the home stretch, until about four weeks out when people actually start to pay attention. Because if you look at the polls right now, if you look at every single poll up to today, uh, Andrew Yang has been leading this race and he has been something of a Teflon candidate, right? There's all this like ticky tacky little shit, uh, a lot of gaffes, a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Waffling. Uh, circumcision gate, the whole certain, dog thing. <laughs> he, he got he got circumcised and it was, you know, it was an <laughs> aggressive campaign move might have backfired on him. Uh, and so far, none of it seems to have been able to pierce his, you know, hey, I'm just a nice guy who's going to fix all the problems, you know, public image. And Ross, you know, I've been reading your writing about this race. I think everyone everyone should read it. You know, there's your blog right there. Uh, what do you think? Is Andrew Yang going to be the next mayor, or is this all a mirage? It, it to me, it's not a mirage because the polling has been very consistent, and while it's been relatively sparse compared to past mayoral races, where the for whatever reason I don't really know why these races were polled really extensively. The, the polls, regardless of the pollster, have shown a very consistent lead for Yang from January until now. Can that change? Yes. Certainly, people will start to tune in in this month and then in June in the final few weeks going into June 22nd. Uh, but I, I caution the left to not get complacent and think Andrew Yang is not really winning and not much needs to be done and he's going to collapse because enough people will see that he's a dilettante. It, it's not so simple. He's definitely very well positioned to capture the Democratic nomination. He may not, but uh, he, he's unquestionably ahead. And, and I, I see this in the polls and I see it anecdotally a, as well. Well, who are considered to be the left candidates in the race? Well, there's three quasi left candidates although there's there's one pretty left and then two two quasi left candidates so uh you know and, until recently scott stringer w was kind of the front runner for the left flank though he'd been a sort of a career democratic insider uh but he was the first ranked choice of the working families party you know this race is under rcv so you can rank up to five candidates so that's new never been done in new york city before mm -hmm. The second choice was Diane Morales, who's actually very new to politics. She was a nonprofit executive until recently. And um, you know, she has captured the hearts of a lot of left activists and, and people in Zoran's district and, and, and sort of places like that. And then the, the third candidate, uh, sort of, of the, less of the left than Wiley, uh, sorry, less, less of the left than um, Morales is Maya Wiley, who was Bill de Blasio's uh, counsel. Um, and who is also competing for kind of these upwardly mobile progressive 
votes, but but certainly is not uh, not someone who's going to win, I'd say, many DSA votes. Morales is the candidate position to do that. And then Stringer and Wiley are more center-left candidates who are competing for some of the DSA vote, but really also a lot of these sort of upscale, uh, I would say, like MSNBC watching uh, liberals who do matter, who do vote in Democratic primaries in New York City. So They matter to us. Yes. <laughs> and there's three. So there's three of them. And, and I think the problem for the left is all three may very well fall short. Because my my was until recently an MSNBC contributor herself. Yes. Right? Is that why you um, kind of remember that way? I frankly, because of that kind of relatively high profile. And the fact that the mayoral race, correct me if I'm wrong, is typically decided by a relatively small number of votes, c- considering how large New York City is. Um that she would be doing better than she is. What are the kind of substantive policy reasons that she isn't considered to be, and this is for anybody, um, mm-hmm. um, a leading left candidate um, as compared at least to Morales? Sure, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. So it's so sort of a two-part thing. One is like the policy and then, then sort of the politics of it. So, I mean, the easy political answer is she's a lousy candidate. And I, mm-hmm. I'm, I guess I'm not being polite here, but so be it. Um, allows me in the sense of she's not charismatic, she's not connecting, she's very lawyerly. Her primary experience in politics is defending Bill de Blasio a lot during investigation, so that's not very exciting to people. And to me, she's running kind of a very, uh, you know, a, a, a very insidery, like left liberal, like academic jar- jargony. Yeah, like, but a, a worse version because Warren, Warren at least was kind of this populist out, you know was a populist outsider and still, you know, I respect her a lot, but she's, but yeah, she's kind of like a lesser version of that campaign, I, I guess is how I would frame it. Um, and, and then, you know, she's, ro- she's rolled out a lot of good policy proposals, certainly in early child care um, and things like that, but there's really no overarching theme or message. And, and kind of one of the things I've been writing a lot about is the fact that to win a mayoral race, like winning any political race, you need, an overarching theme or message, something very succinct people can cling to and remember. And one thing you see in this mayoral race, for reasons I'm still not totally clear on, most of the candidates are really devoid of compelling or interesting messaging. They're devoid of big, memorable policy ideas, not not big, not good ideas, but big and memorable ideas. Bill de Blasio won in 2013 running on curtailing stop and frisk, uh, fighting the tale of two cities, uh, you know, against Michael Bloomberg, and then rolling out a universal pre-K program, right? These are things New Yorkers really thought about that really stuck in their heads. I still don't know exactly like what the Maya Wiley campaign is about. Scott Stringer's campaign, similarly, a lot of good policy, but no overarching theme and message really beyond the fact that he's city controller and he's competent, but that's not really enough. Morales, conversely, does have that compelling messaging. I think that's why she has been connecting with a lot of younger voters. The issue for her is that she's in kind of a limited lane, and I don't know if she has a path to capturing the nomination. Well, what is that theme that's connecting with younger voters? Uh, Defund the police. Uh, Definitely, Morales has leaned in very aggressively into defund in a way none of the other candidates have. So, so for example, you know, Maya Wiley has kind of been trying to have it both ways on that, talking about like a 1 billion cut, but only recently did she float the 1 billion cut. Um, Stringer has been doing like a 1 billion over four years, you know, I mean, who cares? And then, you know, Morales has said, I will cut the NYPD operating budget in half and redirect to social services. So, you know, for, for a lot of younger voters, left voters, that is super compelling that does line up with kind of a lot of activist demands. And, and she's very uncompromising, kind of a good way where you get the sense that she's going to come in to government and really be someone who is not easily pushed around, doesn't give ground on her values. So I do, I do think Diane Morales objectively is running a very good campaign and she's talented. I don't think she has a real path to victory. Right, because she's in, in single digits, right? She's pulled, yeah, she has not pulled that high. She's not well known. I mean, again, I'd say my knock on Morales is, and, you know, Zoran and, and Sia can, can speak to this more. She really had no involvement in left politics at all before this campaign. She was not involved in any of the fights around the IDC against Cuomo, tenant organizing. I mean, her experience as being a 
extremely well compensated executive at a nonprofit uh, called Phipps uh, Neighborhoods, which belongs to Phipps Housing, which is one of the most notorious real estate developers yeah. in the city and evicts a lot of people. So her, her background is a little dubious and she doesn't really have like the cred of being in these movements a long time, but she is talented and, and she, she's leaning in, leaning in hard and identity after a Latina woman. So she's really trying to excite people that way. I want to bring C into this conversation. If we could talk about the differences between these candidates in terms of housing policy, uh, you brought up kind of the elephant in the room, which is that Morales, you know, her, you know, capsule bio is nonprofit executive, but she worked for a housing nonprofit that happens to be one of the biggest evictors in the city. Uh, C, have you been following the mayor's race in terms of this issue? Yeah, sa sadly, sadly, yes, I have been. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry for myself and for everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know that I totally agree with Ross that I that Diane's campaign does have a cohesive message. I think that Diane's campaign message has been like trying to repeat things that like the left has been saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it to me has rung really hollow. Trying Less to be so friendly here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't. I don't. I actually. I don't. I don't disagree with you much either. But yeah, I mean more around defund specifically. Yeah. But yeah. The continue. Completely. Com completely right on defund. On housing, we have. To me, Diane's message could clearly, if if I you know could very clearly be like, look, I know from being a well-paid executive at Phipps Houses, <laughs> which she keeps saying is different. I know, I know than Phipps neighborhoods. It's, it's not. I know that the city when they negotiate affordable housing deals is leaving a ton of money on the table. I know that from experience. I know that the city could drive a harder bargain and we could get to deeper affordability. We could force developers to evict less and we could have, you know, better affordable housing projects. But she's not doing that. She's like walking around Southeast Queens and talking about social housing in Vienna. And so mm -hmm. I don't actually think that that's resonating with voters um, because it's not relevant. And, you know, I think the problem in New York housing right now is that we are spending billions and billions of billions of dollars each year on afford on affordable housing and largely what we're doing with that is propping up an extremely lucrative affordable housing industry mm -hmm. that actually hasn't managed to solve the housing problem and so you know as city comptroller scott is able to talk about that very coherently diane could be talking about that coherently but is not maya has focused her campaign on tenant protections which is something that um that the mayor can do but that albany actually really controls um, so that's kind of where we're at. And then, you know, the rest of the candidates are taking like a real like Yimby stance, like build, yeah. build, build, um, all of them. Middle-class home ownership is a big focus. Um, so who, who is that? there's a lot to be desired. <laughs> I gotta say, as a New Yorker who is still, you know, shipwrecked in DC in part because even with the COVID housing decline, uh, price decline we saw a little bit last year. It just made no sense to move back when I didn't have to. And Ben knows because he came over to my apartment to help me set up uh, some new equipment. And I basically had an existential meltdown about how I feel like I'll never be able to own a house. <laughs> like, what? who are these? Like, what is the, the income bracket of these so-called New York middle class homeowners that are apparently... The, the priority here is isn't that just the Maya Wiley crowd to be ungenerous and in so a I description? Can, yeah. <clears throat> I can I can jump in for a little bit about this because before I was um, an elected official, I worked as a foreclosure prevention housing counselor in uh, an organization called Chaya mm -hmm. in Jackson Heights and Queens and in Richmond Hill, and so the vast majority of my clients or all of my clients rather were actually this kind of category. Mm. Because I think oftentimes to speak to your point, Brie, the term middle class is, is used to cover like, I don't know, 50, 60 percent. Like there's no way it can be a middle. Yeah. Anyone um, up to 400,000, making up to $400,000 know, a year, according to yeah. Joe Biden. So there's there's very, very big um, brackets. And we faced this issue in Albany when we were advocating for taxes on the wealthy as to where does that actually begin. Mm -hmm. um, but the people that I worked with, what I found time and time again, these were uh, predominantly like 
immigrant homeowners who had gotten into homeownership maybe 10, 20 years ago mm. on the basis of continued union salaries mm. that are now the, my clients were facing just, you know, losing their jobs without notice or a family emergency or whatever it may be. And then they were facing mortgage delinquencies. Mm. So, I, but I think the issue that you're also speaking to is the fact that so many of my clients got into this decades ago mm -hmm. in a different kind of economic landscape right now to get into home ownership. I mean, there are city grants that help people, but it's such a particular subset where you have to not eclipse this amount of money so that you can receive this amount of money. And right. then, you know, it's, it's very, very hard. And to speak to what CEO was saying, what passes as affordable is so far from what people actually think to be so or experience as in Astoria in my district on Steinway, there's quote unquote affordable units coming up, which is over $2,000 for a yeah. one bedroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's just market rate. Right. <laughs> so it's, right. you know, it's like, and yeah. the only people who can apply are those who already make $70,000. So it's like, those people are fine, actually. They, like, you know, I'm sure they're not having the best time in their lives, but that's not who the market is leaving behind, people making 70 k a year. Um, so it's, it is in many ways just like a completely broken system as to classification. Yeah. The, the affordable housing, housing lotteries, I, I, I've looked at them and, and the truth be told is you're probably just better at this point going on the market, you know, given oh, you're definitely co better. COVID, COVID definitely. declines. Yeah. I mean, you, you can find a better deal than trying to fit in some weird income bracket to, to still pay a high amount of rent. And, and certainly, you know, my, I, I grew up in, in Brooklyn, in Bay Ridge and, I've like done I fairly well for myself, honestly, all things being considered. There's no way I can buy a home in the place I grew up in. Like it's insane. Like like houses are a million dollar plus, not even that nice houses. You know, we're not talking yeah. great houses with backyards. We're talking about attached homes with like no driveway that are a million dollars. Nobody is nobody no is safe driveways. from us. Nobody no is safe driveways. from Ross. If you have if you have a house with no driveway, Ross thinks it sucks. <laughs> it does. Uh, to buy a house with no driveway it seems ridiculous. To well, me. I don't drive. And a, and a backyard. You know, no backyard, no driveway. No driveway, no backyard. Get out of yeah. here. There's no then own an apartment. That's my view. And apartments are ridiculous too. I mean, even. The bare the bare minimum one bedroom you're talking 300k yes just and, just and to get it those, just to get in the door I remember looking when I was still a, a, a lawyer at a firm um, a boutique firm making like less than you know big big law market but the only houses that I saw that made sense for me affordability wise were like three hundred thousand dollars studios yeah. that then I was precluded from buying because I was considered to make too much. And I was like, well, I feel like I can barely afford this. Who who are they imagining like a two family? They're imagining two people living in this studio because that's the only way it would be affordable for anybody under the income bracket. And and what's yeah. so terrifying about this is that sometimes the only way people can get affordable houses that they could purchase are from those who are being foreclosed upon. Yeah. You know, like people who are suffering the most then yeah. being evicted and then their properties become the only possibilities for a lot of people. So I would go to mosques and churches. I would go all around Queens talking about if anyone needs help to stave off foreclosure. And I would always have an uncle who'd pull me aside at the end and be like, where can I buy the foreclosed house? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, be like, I'd be like, uncle, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not helping with that. But I know why you need that because that's – I this know. is the zero sum t t for yeah. to an interview we just did. This is the zero sum situation that you know working people find themselves in. Well, yeah, it's like the central trap of American politics, which is just like weak or for housing, right? Like you know, I organize renters, and like I'm fighting for rent control. That is like ninety percent of like what I'm doing in my day to day life. And what we're describing is changing the like the changing the nature of housing politics there's like a growing renter movement we just won some of the strongest tenant protections in the country two years ago or actually a little less than that you know like really strong rent controls and that's happening across the country because our public policy doesn't reflect the reality but at the same time everybody's like wealth and like life savings you can't have it unless you become a homeowner yep. yeah so yeah. The more that like people of our generation, that's just not an option. It's just not on the table, yeah. not just in New York City, but everywhere. Yeah, but actually, then also at the same time, our public policy doesn't protect renters. How are you going to retire? It's yeah. just a trap. Yeah, that's what every if you make any amount of money. That's what any accountant will tell you. No, it's just buy this house and then you can rent you it buy, out. On the property. It's going to just going to appreciate because there's no way that the American housing market can fail because no, policymakers it can't let it fail. fail. We would be fail. so fucked if we had another crash. <laughs> 
uh, we didn't rebound like we did from the the 2007 crash. See, so I, I was hoping we could, we could bring this conversation a little down to earth and maybe kind of explain a little bit for the audience. Can you give us a rundown of what New York City's housing policy, the principles of our housing policy, uh, have been under Comrade de Blasio? Comrade, com and and my comrade, Bill de Blasio. And why, and why, <laughs> and why this is failing, why the status quo is failing badly. Totally. Um, so de Blasio actually, I think, made sort of the sort of central problem for a lot of American cities is that in order to pay for stuff, you need um, economic development and you need property taxes to go up. You can't like, you know, and you know, we just got off a big fight in Albany about trying to raise taxes on millionaires and billionaires. It was fucking brutal, excuse me for swearing. Um, and you know, we didn't do nearly as well as we wanted to. And we did better than anyone has done in generations. So the central housing policy has to be gentrification for any single mayor, because in order to pay for schools, for subways, for universal child care, for any of the things that you say you want to pay for, you need property taxes to go up because that's like the only stable source of income for a city, um, any city, which cities can't tax themselves. And so what de Blasio really did is he did two things. He like made some sort of bargain. He actually did pretty well when it comes to some sort of like limited amounts of tenant protection. So we have um, rent control in New York. So there's a city board that essentially votes on how much your rent is allowed to go up each year um, for about half of the housing stock. De Blasio put, you know, zero, like stacked it with tenant advocates and it's like 0%, 1%, 2% rent increases for, for the, you know, the entire mayoralty. That's a market different from Bloomberg where we're seeing 7% rent increases pretty consistently. He also passed the first right to counsel law, um, a right to an attorney in housing court in the entire country. And that, mm -hmm. that's a reflection of an organized base of renters. Um, but at the same time as de Blasio is giving us these things, he was also pushing like massive amounts of city capital to afford for-profit affordable housing developers in neighborhoods that were economically distressed mm. um, to build city subsidized above market housing, mm. but subsidized, but above the above the local market, in an effort to sort of, he would say, desegregate that neighborhood and others would say gentrify that neighborhood and you know I, I i think that de blasio wouldn't take it i mean he wouldn't say it's gentrification he would say it's like bringing economic investment to distressed neighborhoods that have been redlined and to a certain degree that's true but of course these are also the neighborhoods that are home to working class people of color rising rents in these neighborhoods where there's a lot of unregulated housing stock small buildings where there's a lot of working class homeowners who are then getting you know knock on their door, like, can I buy your house for like all cash and you take it. And so to me, the story of de Blasio's housing plan was protecting already the most protected renters even further, which is a good thing to do. Um, and then at the same time, you know, using city subsidy to like spur market development to like raise taxes, um, raise, raise property, raise you know, the city's income. Um, and that's a bargain that any mayor is going to face. And unless we have deeper, deeper investment from the federal government and deeper investment from Albany, I'm sort of like at a loss. I mean, the next mayor could do more with the non-for-profit affordable housing community. There's other things you could do, but um, yeah, so that's it. So, and, you know, the follow-up question to that is, what would a socialist housing policy for New York City, you know, one that's presumably replicable in mm -hmm. other parts of the country, what would that look like? What would a socialist urbanism look like? And then, you know, from that, we can we can open up that conversation in, in the context of mayor's race in Albany. Yeah, so what I would do is I would, first of all, you need to expand rent controls to cover smaller buildings and that needs to happen in Albany but there's also more that the mayor could do who's being covered now which what kind of buildings are being covered now buildings with six or more apartments 
Oh, because um, in my in my head, I'm like, I thought already because I lived in a unit with eight apartments and I, it was rent controlled, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and to me that was already a small building. But you're saying even you know like individual, yeah, like, yeah. single yeah. family homes or like and four, two family homes, and, mm-hmm. yeah, like the the neighborhoods that Zoran's describing in Queens, like ha or Bay Ridge, um, you know, half of the city's housing stock is in like four to six unit apartment mm. buildings. That are that were once affordable home ownership opportunities for immigrants and are now overwhelmingly being bought up by yeah. organizations like Blackstone or like whatever, yeah. or mm-hmm. even like medium sized slumlords. Mm-hmm. So, rent control and they need to be rent controlled. And the reason why they need to be rent controlled is not because like rent control is inherently socialist, but because rent control limits the speculative value of the land. Like our goal is to have the housing actually be worthless mm-hmm. in, to some degree, right? Like we don't want this to be an investment vehicle. We want it to be like long-term stable homes. We don't need people to become millionaires off their homes. Um, so that's the first thing that I would do. And then the second thing that you know socialists need to really think about is how are we exploring um, models? And there's some transitional models, mutual housing associations, community land trusts, um community opportunity to purchase like mechanisms to municipalize more and more of the housing stock and like if you have public housing over here which new york city is blessed to still have a great deal of Mm -hmm. private home ownership over here what like there's a lot of policy mechanisms that can take everything that's on like the right and like move it in this move it towards i'm on a podcast so like i can't (laughs) believe i'm visualizing this but move things in the spectrum to municipalize it there's lots of things that New York City has done over the over a hundred years to do that, and we could do it again. Community land trust. I see Zoran. You reacted to that. Uh, so, if, if either of you want to break us break it down for us, what a community land trust is. It's very interesting. Yeah, I feel like Sia is. You know, I get most of my knowledge on housing from Sia. So, if you get it from me, it's just not coming from the source. But I, I would say that. Um, basically, a community land trust. My very basic explanation of it would be piece of land that is owned by the community, different, you know, I hate this word and I can't believe I'm going to say it, but stakeholders in the community. Um, and and Ready then to become a nonprofit can, executive now. Here, here the, the pe- um, you could run for then, mayor. Right. Then you could run for mayor. I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to move past this. By stakeholders, you mean PMCs, right? Yeah, exactly. No, but so basically you have you have land that is community owned and then individuals are able to own the property that is built upon the land. But then the value of their property is derived from purely the structure as opposed to the land. And so it completely changes the model of where value comes from and what ownership looks like. And it ensures that the people who both live within that area of the trust as well as, you know, just part of the larger neighborhood, those people are all supposed to be reflected in the kind of board or ownership structure of the land itself. So if you can if you can control the land value, then it takes away the possibility of rapid and massive speculation. Um, that's and that for me is and for so many is what really the appeal of CLTs is is how do we, as Sia said, bridge together the promise of home home ownership and the reality of tenancy. And the other thing that I would also add is that, you know, in my neighborhood in Astoria, we're not that far away from where Amazon's headquarters was pitched to be. Mm-hmm. And I door knocked a number of um, number of my neighbors over the course of that time uh, as part of Queen's DSA's door knocking operation um, to respond to Amazon's proposal. And I met a number of homeowners who did not want Amazon to come into the neighborhood because like so many of my clients, they were cash poor homeowners. And they knew that if Amazon came in, their value of their home would skyrocket, which for them was a bad thing because they couldn't afford the ensuing property tax rise. Yeah. And so yeah. that's the the fundamental issue is for people who want to stay in their community, do not want to cash out. They don't have a way to respond to this. And one thing that I'm really interested in is that, you know, when we were advocating for higher income taxes and we were advocating for this package known as the Invest in Our New York package, which sought to raise $50 billion in annual revenue by taxing the wealthy, I would talk often about the fact that we say in New York that it's unconstitutional to have a wealth tax, but we have a property tax, which is basically a wealth tax on all but the ultra wealthy. 
Because as you get wealthier, you diversify your money into more than just property. And that is a, a central issue is that the people who actually have the most money are not the ones who are facing this kind of burden vis-a-vis a property tax. They have their money in stocks and art and whatever it may be. Um, and so that was like a, a tension that we were trying to pull at in these negotiations. I'm but sorry, and of course, a lot of urban development is based on the idea that real estate developers don't pay property taxes, but homeowners do. Uh, Bree, I, I want to hear uh, uh, your thing. I just wanted to, to chime in and say, you know, one last note on community land trusts. Uh, another American city was facing a, a similar issue of a lot of newcomers coming in, rents going up. Uh, that was Burlington in the 1980s, mm-hmm. where a young mayor uh, pursued this very policy of community land trusts. Bernie Sanders. What happened? I, Big body burn. Uh, well, he, he uh, got cheated by the DNC uh, in the 2016 presidential election. I, I mean, the end so, of that story. So, and you said something um, a little uh, earlier about wanting kind of to marry the promise of home ownership with um, the realities of tenancy. The, the reality of tenancy. Maybe this is a somewhat too esoteric a question, but. How much do we have to invest in this idea that there's this promise of home ownership? Do we have to, how long do we have to continue to invest in the idea that to have any kind of stability to grow wealth in this country, it all has to link back to the system, which seems so fundamentally inequitable and also which forces you to buy into a certain commitment to property and stagnation. And, you know, as a millennial, I don't especially want to own a home. I don't. Yeah. I, 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 do not want to own a home, but I feel like I'm getting shafted <laughs> by paying so yep. much in rent and not gaining yep. equity. And I just, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna- <laughs> no, and I, and I, I think this is a great point. And, and I, and I want to clarify that by promise, I don't mean an innate or, or like a, how do I say this? I mean, what it actually has become, how it's understood by people, if that makes any sense. So not mm. that it's an, it's, it, not that it's a good thing. But then mm. when I talk to people who are looking for stability, who are looking for a way to build their life around that, I want them to see that which they see from home ownership yeah. in a completely separate model of of housing. Because I think you're completely right. And, and, and as Sia just also um, was saying, right, this is exclusionary. This is I, – I do not have any patience or desire – to invest in the same broken model and just have different winners and different losers. Yeah. Because that so often is what I'm worried about is that we we're just like, oh, 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 this is fine. But really, you know, what we need is capitalism for a different section of society. And right. I find like so many of my friends, you know, who'll be like, I'll they'll like send me an Instagram video of what they're watching. It's like all these hustler entrepreneurs were like, what you need to do to make it work for you <laughs> is to be like Jay-Z. And it's like, no, <laughs> don't, don't Barclay Center, New York City. Don't it's, Atlantic Yard. What, what's, what's better than one billionaire too, especially <laughs> yeah. if he's, you know, black than you or so, whatever. You know, that's a regular segment on this show when we give people crypto advice, how to hustle. <laughs> That's what I came on for, and and I thought Ross was going to give me a couple insights. Yeah, buy, <laughs> buy, on how to hustle. Buy, buy crypto. <laughs> buy crypto now. It keeps going up in value. Um, Doge. Do, do, yeah, do, do, I don't Doge even know what that is, up. but my my friend talks about it so, all the time. Do, Doge is hot now. You can buy Ethereum. You can buy Bitcoin. Going all in on crypto. Um, <laughs> the the New York. I mean, the thing about New York housing is. You don't have to like appeal to like a I think a utopian socialist ideal, which which you, I mean you should, but you can really just look at the history of New York City and see for basically the entire stretch of the 20th century, housing was pretty reasonable in New York. I mean, I, I'm a third generation, you know, New Yorker. Uh, my mother bought a co-op in the late 1980s for like eighty thousand dollars, which even with inflation would be under two hundred thousand dollars today. You know, people are buying houses for a hundred grand, maybe, maybe less, you know, you see in, in the sixties, like brownstones in, you know, in, in Park Slope at a time when crime was a lot higher, brownstones would be going for thirty, forty thousand dollars and, and, and rent, and you could be a lifelong renter because rent was fairly stable. We had a very large and, you know, robust rent stabilization program, bigger than we had today, uh, rent controlled apartments, 
public housing, which much better maintained. You had a very strong Mitchell Lama program. You had developments like Park Chester, where uh, AOC has an apartment now, you know, um, Stytown, Peter Cooper Village. There are just so many different, you know, types of affordable housing that were available in New York for a very long time, coupled with a rent market that was always like fairly reasonable, probably until the Michael Bloomberg mayorality and kind of like hyper gentrification. Like I would say, through the 1990s, you could rent an apartment at like a decent rate in like most neighborhoods in New York City, and it would be a reasonable share of your income. And you could probably be a lifelong renter and save money and do pretty well. I mean, I think the challenge is, as Brianna is getting at, I think any New Yorker feels it's like, well, you don't want to buy because the prices are astronomical and stupid, especially when you just look at any other locality in America. It's like, wow, like why buy here when I can buy a house for not even a studio in New York City, right? And you don't want to, right? Do you want to be chained to a $500,000 apartment? Like, no, that that sounds dumb. Um, but then renting feels like a scam too, because you're paying so much of your income into rent and you're not building equity. So, you know, I think we're really caught in this cycle and I would like to see a lot more, you know, rent stabilization, you know, community land trusts, um, you know, actual affordable housing built by real estate developers, um, you know, I've been told there's a lot of sort of landlords with distressed properties that could be bought out because a lot of them are over leveraged. I've been told this is like, could be a good way into social housing. So, uh, I mean, really, I mean, the frustrating thing being like a young New Yorker and reading about the history is New York had a lot of problems in like the, the, the forties, the fifties, the sixties, the seventies, the eighties, it was not ideal at all, but the thing it had was really like fairly affordable housing for most people. Mm -hmm. Like if you had a job, you could be single, you get an apartment in Manhattan, you get it in Brooklyn and you could live your life. Are you giving dating advice? So I think, yeah. <laughs> so I think that the thing though, that like Ross is, Ross, Ross is completely right, but there's two things that he didn't name about that history. The first is that a lot of the co-ops are limited equity cooperatives. So like the promise of things like, Penn South or Co-op City or like a vast amount of like um, squat, like distressed housing that was squatted and then converted into like limited equity cooperatives, which community land trusts also do. So you can't sell it at any price. You're earning equity, but not, not a lot of equity. Yes. So that's like the first thing that's like, the first thing is it's like a shared, you're, to the extent that your property is raising in value, you're raising the collective value for the neighborhood as a whole, not for yourself. And then the second thing is that, you know, the reason why people can rent and stay in New York City and be lifelong renters is that we also had, one, a lot of people who are union members, who had fixed benefit pensions, who were able to retire and be renters, and they didn't need their home to be the thing that was going to allow them to retire and, like, live the rest of their life. And then, like, a pretty robust social safety net. Um, in addition to like um, a deep union density, so there's like yeah. other parts of our so of our society that are taking care of us here. That is not true where people just rely on their home ownership. Does and, that make sense? and unions and unions would build their own housing. The Coops in the Bronx, mm -hmm. Garment Workers Union, Electchester in mm -hmm. Queens. I mean, this was a time when unions would pool their resources and buy apartments for their members. I mean, this thing is kind of like, it's kind of unimaginable today, but you could be belong to a union, have a good job and get incredibly cheap housing and live with other union members. And this whole model is just so alien to like today's world. And, and it, and it worked. I mean, obviously a lot of, you know, I mentioned Park Chester and Stytown, they were, they were racist for a long time, barred blacks from getting in there and Latinos. But, um, you know, once they did diversify and, you know, they became pretty good housing models. So, you know, we're, we're just so far removed from a lot of this stuff. I think the hope for it in this, maybe not with this mayor's race or, you know, with Albany is to kind of somehow recapture some of that. Uh, you know, actually taking things back to the mayor's race. So you have the leftish candidates, none of whom are socialists, none of whom are, are committed to decommodifying houses. Uh, and then you have the well, UB issue. Oh, I would sorry. push a little bit on that characterization. Um, okay, go for it. And I know that I'll I'll get in trouble here with my fellow panelists. You're uncommit. You're uncommitted in the race. Is that right? I haven't made an endorsement as yet. I I mean I think that it you know I think that there's 
it's not fair to Morales's campaign to group her in with someone like Wiley. And in terms of, I think Sia's critique earlier about talking about, you know, Vienna housing versus talking about something that's built off of what's already existing in New York City, I don't think takes away from Morales's messaging about, you know, social housing, housing as a human right, and really very similar language, if not the same language, from a lot of socialist frameworks that we've been putting as candidates. And I know that she has said that, I don't think she identifies as a socialist, but a lot of her policies definitely look very similar. Well, how do we know? I mean, and I don't say this because the skepticism is coming from anywhere because I haven't been following this that closely, but if we don't know a lot about her background and record and she's kind of new to the political scene altogether, how do we know that she's not engaging in the kind of sloganeering that we've seen from a lot of moderates right now, including people like Joe Biden, who is singing from the rooftops that healthcare is a human right as he pivots to a conversation about how much your premiums are going to be under his plan. Well, I, I would say that, you know, and I think that's a very good instinct to like ask how much of the rhetoric is real. I think with her, what gives me confidence in her rhetoric is the fact that in the different examples along this race, there's been a different, there's been a difference in the way in which she responds to events. So I think about Cuomo, especially. Um, I think that Morales was the first to call for the impeachment of Cuomo of any of the mayoral candidates. And that kind of speaks to relationship to power, which is something that for me has become like when I'm in Albany, there are so many people who espouse progressive policies, but when it comes to challenging leadership in order to have those policies be heard on the floor are unwilling to do so. And <laughs> they actually the matter. <laughs> I'm, I'm just so point not, in the jar, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just, you know, pass that over. <laughs> um, no, point, point taken. I have a but, lot of and, admiration yeah. people who are willing to force adversarial moments in politics. It really says yeah. something about a person. So, so I think that um, her response to Cuomo was something that I thought was very important in understanding. And the other thing I would say is that um, new to po- like new to politics, I think, is a bit unfair because she might not have been a public persona vis-a-vis these fights, IDC, you know, Zephyr, Nixon, all of these other races. But I think that she is somebody that has come from a world of kind of social services in the city. So, but are we calling it's hard? I, I, I'm less are kind. Calling, I would yeah. be less kind. Than I know. That. I know you are. I know you. Are. <laughs> no, no. I, I, and I, I, and I, I would... agree. She's the most left in, in the race. I, I think. I think this the service angle, though. I don't know. Like, I'm. I'm. I'm just reflexively. I, I don't know. I'm more reflexively skeptical of nonprofits. I, I think not. Not all of them. I think some of them are great. I do think in a, in an ideal world, the city government would be performing services directly and not like farming out so much to kind of these nonprofits that really, a, a lot of them really just pad executive salaries and, and don't pay their workers very much. You know, I've looked at, you know, FIPS, for example, several extremely high compensated executives, her included. So I, I don't doubt her convictions at all. And I agree with you. She was standing up to Cuomo. That's super important. Scott Stringer never stood up to Cuomo, ever supported him in 2018. Maya Wiley, I mean, is working for de Blasio and not saying anything, right? So I, I, Morales definitely shines in, in that context. Um, I, I do judge her a bit more harshly in terms of the, the lack of involvement where, you know, she was, uh, she was doing fine for herself. And I'm sure the social service side of FIPS does good things. I asked her about it. She was kind of vague. I still don't have a great handle on what the social services side does. I do understand what the real estate development side does. Um, and she was questioned recently on, did she wish she could hold FIPS more accountable? And and her answer was a little defensive. Like, well, what, what was I supposed to do? Like issue mm-hmm. press release and... You know, I mean, I think she she's the best. She's the best the left has in this race. She's not a Zoran Mamdani. I would I'd be more excited if Zoran was there. So, so yeah, what's um, your what's your take personally. on Morales? And also, I just want to point out, our audience does not know what the hell FIPS is. No. <laughs> so <laughs> I can say what FIPS is. <laughs> so Please. FIPS houses is one of. <laughs> I'm like to give a history lesson. Initially. Please. What, what was happening was um, unions were building housing for their workers. Nelson Rockefeller was like, we need to get more private developers to be building the housing, made all these changes. And Phipps Houses was one of the first big private developers. They're also a not-for-profit that started building a lot of 
low-income and middle-income housing in New York City. They're like a big like anti-poverty organization. They very much are like, they're not like, they're not like, there's lots of different types of nonprofits. There's like nonprofits that do like community organizing and there's nonprofits that do um, legal like eviction defense. And there's, you know, they are, they're like an anti-poverty social services organization and they provide a lot of housing. They are notoriously anti-union. So in addition to not really being great for their tenants and evicting a lot of their tenants, they also are on the wrong side of every single union in the city, both the building trades, 32BJ, um, and even there's been a push, they're a huge employer, right? There's been a push to unionize not-for-profit employees um, and they've also been on the other side of, of that work. And so whatever, they're an actor who is like thrived under the choice to export a lot of the welfare state from the state itself to the not-for-profit mm. community. Um, so that's what FIP says. As to Diane and her like leftist credentials, I don't, I guess, actually know if it matters whether she believes these things or if she's just saying them. I think that the politicians are going to be reflective of the power that the movement has built to a large degree. And then, and then, of course, the politicians who are our friends, like Zoran. And there's going to be, you know, the politicians who, like, look, Diane, like, saw this as her lane to run. And she is running. Um, and so she should she become mayor? You know, I think that the need to continue to organize a working class base that's going to be building that outside power to, like, see which way the wind is blowing for her is, would be, like, tremendously important. And I think, you know, Stringer woke up in, like, 2018, saw that, like, Julia was going to be elected to the state Senate, like, became a communist. <laughs> and, like, that's fine. And Diane being like, oh, there's a growing left movement in New York, and that's my lane that I'm going to run in, that's fine, too. Like, they're reflective of the tools of, like, how organized we are. The problem is, is that, like, we are not organized enough for Diane to win, and I don't even know that she's, like, trying to win. Wait, well, that's, um, that was going to be my next question because there's an extent to which when you're ar- not doing well in the polls and you're arguably just a, not just, but, like, a kind of a more message candidate, performative candidate, that you can take bold stances like going up against Cuomo because you don't really have much to lose. And the elephant in the room is that my understanding was Scott Stringer was considered to be the leftiest candidate that was likely to win. And now what we haven't talked about in this podcast is the recent, you know, sexual assault allegations against him, which like many of these allegations are, uh, he said, she said situation that is currently being investigated. And, but that, that limbo leaves the left without a lot of places to go. And, the Sunrise Movement, WFP, and others have withdrawn, have, have rescinded their endorsements of Scott Stringer. Whether or not some people are arguing it's been done prematurely, especially in the wake of what happened with them. Um, what's his face? Well, uh, in Morris, Massachusetts, Morris, Alex Morris. Yeah. But it, that's a hard that's a hard road to toe, given that I think everyone would agree that we want you would hate to continue to backstringer and find the claims to be validated down the line. No, it's not good. <laughs> it's yeah, no, it, it's, it's definitely, you know, it, it raises a, a lot of really big issues that I do think people in politics and people on the left have to reckon with, um, t- to be quite frank. You know, if you look at the situation, with Andrew Cuomo, he's been accused by, I think at this point, a, a dozen different women of either sexual harassment or like a hostile work environment. He also has a concurrent nursing home scandal. He's getting a federal investigation, Mm -hmm. AG's investigation. You know, I think you can credibly call for Andrew Cuomo to resign, and many people have. And I I thought DSA and Zoran put out a pretty nuanced statement about that, about abuse of power, lying to the state legislature, you know, his horrible COVID response, right? There's a lot to work with. Mm -hmm. The the Stringer situation, it's different, right? You have an allegation that is quite severe. If 
if indeed it happened, if you take her word for it, it's also one allegation with no track record in terms of like Stringer's behavior. I, you know, I've heard he can be a nasty guy behind the scenes, but never, no one has ever said, you know, this man is a sexual predator who has a hostile work environment. You know, women have worked for him for years and, and there have been no complaints. So you have an allegation. Um, it cannot be corroborated, right? As you said, he said, she said, there's no way to corroborate it. I do think there is a bigger question. I don't have the answer for this with how the left especially is going to reckon with these allegations going forward. Because my fear, this is my fear, to be frank, is if I were a political operative who was not a progressive or leftist, I were a moderate conservative political operative, and I saw an ascendant left candidate, I'm not going to use Scott Stringer as an example, because I think Sia's characterization is correct. He's kind of, you know, became a, a left candidate in 2018 and has been an insider most of his career. But, you know, and marking it. Yes. He's pulling the, a marquee. <laughs> he's definitely pulling a, pulling a marquee. Um, so, you know, but, but let's say, you know, a scenario where there's like a, a strong left candidate who's got a shot to win their candidate who is, you know, very maybe, you know, good, but also disruptive and you could really change things. If I were a political operative on the opposite side, I would concoct a allegation out of thin air to destroy them. And I, I, this is, I don't think this is happening here, um, but I just think this is something we may have to reckon with in the future because it's incredibly plausible and easy to pull off, especially when there are no longer any demands for corroboration of any kind, right? Usually, if you read like articles about Me Too, at least the person tells a friend at the time about what happened, right? That's usually the most basic bedrock we can use as well did they did they tell confide in a friend about this we don't we have with this allegation which, which again i i do think could very well be true we don't have any of that and the question is what do you do with it right the left establishment made their choice working families party right politics is about politics it's it's not about you know these not about these moral values here it's they made a political calculation it was better for their brands to withdraw than to stick with Scott, right? Yeah, moreover, there's some hypocrisy here, right? To, to the point made, I think it's some reporting from The Intercept, you know, when the Tarbid ac- accusations came out, um, my Wiley released, you know, wrote, wrote an article saying that, you know, you have to investigate the claims and ha- give people benefit of the doubt and all this, this kind of stuff. Um, but she's withdrawn, you know, she's yeah. kind of condemned Stringer That's immediately politics. in this instance, right? Okay. And the Stringer got campaign, different interests. <laughs> I mean, right. You know, and that it, it is what it is. But in terms of your point, Ross, about, you know, whether or not there was a contemporary corroboration that did someone tell a friend at the time, that's something that Tara Reid actually had. And apparently um, uh, Kim, uh, the woman in this instance, did not. Stringer's campaign has, in fact, accused, uh, no, no basis that I know of, um, Kim of of having some relationship with Andrew Yang's campaign. There's all of this stuff swirling around, right? Yeah. But yeah, the res- I mean, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. You can, you can finish. Just the response from the left, because I think the left sees itself as more rooted firmly in the values of, you know, gender equality and believing women and wanting to right some of the historical wrongs is quicker to come to a conclusion than people who are less ideologically rooted. And that ultimately makes us more vulnerable to anybody who would want to weaponize that against left movements. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think Stringer, Stringer, I would say, cost himself these endorsements by his very kind of, you know, aggressive reaction. You know, I, I think you know, he really attacked this woman. He said, you know, she was tied to Andrew Yang. Uh, you know, really went very hardcore scorched earth against her, which I think was wrong. You know, you should not impugn someone like that. Like, I think the thing to do is just to be say, I deny these allegations. They're wrong. Uh, look at my record. Now I want to talk. I'm going to go talk about something else now. Ask me about transportation. I'm not taking any more questions. I respect her. I respect her view, but but I think she's wrong and I didn't do these things, right? You deny and then you move on. Instead, he did this like multi-day cycle of like, basically burn down Gene Kim. It's very like old school mm. New York politics thing. It did not work. I think it could have worked 20 years ago, backfired horribly. And I think that's why like Julia Salazar, Biagi, 
they all withdraw that withdrew like this is this is not for me this this did not work but but to your point but, i mean i mean the weaponization it, that is it is a threat we haven't quite seen it yet but it's it's something of i again well, if was I were, alex morse not us seeing that that was yeah i would say that was the that was probably that's a good point that was probably the beginning of it i would say we haven't seen it widely employed but yes the alex morse was an example of like a pretty clear weaponization of allegations and so my fear is right again if you're like a a, a conservative political operative a moderate I, I use the example like a liz smith right like I, I would be this is what you would do like this is the playbook right do it to morse find find someone have an allegation maybe it's iffy but if if no longer we are demanding corroboration or evidence of any kind then it does open up this space i don't know what happened with stringer he very well could be guilty he very well could be a sexual predator but with cuomo we have very fresh out i mean we have very fresh allegations these are women talking about behavior that happened last year. They confided in people. Yeah. It, it, there's there's, there's, there's a lot them, to, it's, you yeah. can go on it. You, you can have an investigation. There's a hot dog video. <laughs> oh my God. 20, 20 years ago, it, it's hard. It's just, it's hard. Like where, how do you deal with these issues? I don't have the answer. I don't know if anyone does, but I do think the left in general really is going to have to start thinking hard about how do you handle situations like this in the future? I actually, we do. Um, just like a different take on the politics of it, though. Mm-hmm. Like, like the left was already going to rank Morales 1 and Stringer 2 and maybe Maya 3. And the question to me is, does any of these unendorsements mean that, like, how many people are going to rank now Morales 1, Maya 2, and then Stringer 3? Because what if they don't rank him go. three? Right, what if the they just leave is, it? That's the question. Yeah. That's the question. Is the left going to rank him or not when they go into the voting booth? And I think some definitely won't. And like some probably still will because Mm -hmm. there's nowhere else to go. And then the other thing is like a lot of Stringer's base isn't the left. Stringer's new base is the left. But like Stringer's new base Stringer's old base is not the left. They're not abandoning him. Mm. Stringer's new base is the left, but they were already ranking Diane one. So, like, we're just, like, cornering, like, I'm not sure at the end of the day what impact this is going to have on Stringer's electability. And so we're just going to have to see. I'm just, yeah. with rank choice voting, I'm just actually not sure. I, 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 I agree, agree with, with the that. larger point. I agree with the larger point on, like, the left has to figure out yeah. what to do, but, like, I think Stringer's campaign is fine. The the the, yeah, the, the politics. I, I would agree in that. I I'm not convinced. I don't think this destroys his campaign. I think it's going to make it hard to ascend or break out. But yeah, I, I think his base is there. I think older kind of baby boomers and people like that are just less moved by Me Too stuff. Unfortunately, with like Cuomo, you're seeing this. A lot of older Democrats are still sticking with him, and I think Stringer is like such a less severe version of kind of like the twelve Cuomo allegations that. Yeah, Stringer, Stringer's people are going to stick with him. I think it's like a very bad news cycle. I think it hurts his ability to grow and kind of be the alternative to Yang and Eric Adams. But, you know, he, we'll see how the polls come out on this. But he's probably just going to float where he is. People on the Upper West Side, traditional, just kind of like older Democrats, like left of center. They'll go, oh, we know Scott. We like Scott. I think it's why you saw like Jerry Nadler didn't withdraw his endorsement of Stringer, the UFT yeah. did not withdraw it either. So, but that that to you know. me that's proof that's proof of concept of what those endorsements actually mean. Biden's base endorsement base didn't withdraw over Tarry. It's not like unions, Democratic Party operatives, MSNBC stopped cheering Biden over Bernie just because those allegations came out. Cuomo's genuine base for the most part, has stuck with him. Alex Morris, his base was with this progressive movement and like this mm. kind of like Jacobin left and they with, withdrew. And so the question is, the left already has limited power. And whether or not, if you really think, like this is what Biden said around Tara Reid too, if you think I did it, you shouldn't vote for me. If, if anyone thinks that he really did it, then arguably they shouldn't be ranking him third, they shouldn't be ranking him at all. And so if we really believe what we say in terms of our, our morals and values, then this should be consequential for him, even in a ranked choice voting context. That's all. Yeah. I, I, it's just hard to say how, how like voters are going to react, really react to this. 
you know, I, cause I, I, I do think, yes, the, the younger left will absolutely, if they were going to put him on the ballot, they may just drop him now. Totally. I just stick with Morales. Um, I think with this race too, again, people, as you know, like don't fit into neat ideological boxes. I mean, you're going to have ballots with Morales and Andrew Yang on them. Yeah. hundred percent. may have a lot of them, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, the, the WFP ballot, like the dream, like what it was just Stringer, Morales, Wiley ballot. Like you, you may not see many of those at all. You, like that's, that's kind of Yang's strength. He's going to be showing up on a lot of ballots. Like that's just, that's RCV. I think is just going to help him because it, it's like, there's no neighborhood where at this point, like someone's not going to be throwing Andrew Yang on their ballot. Is there a substantive reason in terms of housing or any of these po- other lefty policy issues? Because we've heard a lot of kind of silly criticisms of Yang. Oh, he gave his dog away. He's anti-Semitic because he doesn't <laughs> want to circumcise his kids. Yada, yada. Silly shit because he's anti-Semitic. Now. Yeah. He's no, now, now, now he's like the Hasidic Jewish candidate. So Yeah, he is. He <laughs> it, it, con- it, it, consolidated that vote The apology faster. worked anyone in history (laughs) well look but uh, are there substantive reasons is he really is he just kind of neutral or is he bad for some of these progressive housing goals what has he said about things like all of the kind of covid era um you know protections for renters etc that have been in place are there substantive things we know about what he would do in office that should give progressives pause sure um you want to go? I can. Go. I know you can. You can answer the housing part. Yeah, you know, I have general critiques, but if you want to talk on his housing platform, you can go ahead. Sure. On the housing side, I mean, like he's opposed to strengthening tenant protections on unregulated units. Um, what, does he give is, a reason? Uh, he has studied in the issue. Um, same so. same thing Biden's doing with marijuana <laughs> and student debt relief. Some, Got it. It's important to study. Um, he wants to, and then like other other sort of things to like speed up regulation and approval of projects, which isn't great, you know, uh, making it easier to build in New York City. Um, and, you know, some of it that's just like, so the, the bad is that he doesn't support tenant protections and that he wants to speed up development and projects. And then like, you know, some confusing things like eliminating something called member deference, which is where the city council members... Um, are supposed to vote the way the local council member does. Um, you can't like eliminate an unspoken rule in the city council as mayor. So it doesn't make any sense. Like mm-hmm. he's going to make it like illegal for council members to like vote the way it, it that's just like that's not a law. It doesn't make sense. Like it's not like <laughs> like there is like an unspoken rule that council members are like supposed to follow the lead of the local member. Do I think it's great for the city? Probably not. Can Andrew Yang eliminate it? No. It doesn't make sense. But see, so, he's, an, he's an ideas guy. Come on. <laughs> he's just giving us ideas. Well, you don't like the ideas? Yeah. Come on. I mean, yeah. to, to me to me with Yang, you know, I think fundamentally he's just, you know, he'll be another kind of center left Democrat with like, you know, a, a fairly neoliberal approach to development. You know, I, I think people are viewing him as like a disruptor radical, but really it's more like, He's another Koch, like Bloomberg, you know, even de Blasio, right? He's going to come in, view housing in the way housing has always been viewed. You know, his approach to policing would have been mainstream in like 2013, but is now regarded as conservative in that he does not want to cut funding to the NYPD at all, Um, which again, if defund is your issue, that is a a major concern, you know, enforcement of, of licensed street vendors that bubbled up recently. I don't think that'll come into play much because the city council has already will up those licenses. But I mean, I, th- I think the general concern with Yang is he could be a vessel kind of for the M- Mike Bloomberg acolytes. You know, Bradley Tusk is cited a lot. You know, that's that's my concern. And that in general, you know, he is someone who will not be receptive to or, or not innately embracing of left goals on housing, on criminal justice. That being said, you know, I think Yang is movable in that he, he is, he would come in as a, a weak mayor and not a strong mayor, weak in terms of he does not arrive with any institutional help. He does not arrive with organized labor. He he, he, he can be pushed and, and fought back against. Well, isn't I, there a fear that as a neophyte mayor, and especially as a guy who's relied on this kind of kind of paper thin positive public reputation? And who's a guy who likes to say yes to whoever he's talking to, that yes. he's someone who can be steamrollered by the powerful and wealthy interests taking over the city? 
Yes, no, absolutely. Um, the, the issue is there isn't really a candidate in contention who is n- would not have like a close working relationship with Wall Street and the real estate industry. I think Eric Adams, the Brooklyn Borough President, very he he's a landlord. He's very open about fundraising from the real estate industry. So so yes, I agree with you. You know, Yang is someone absolutely could be steamrolled by the financial elite of the city or used as their pawn. Or it could be a symbiotic relationship like it was with Bloomberg mm-hmm. and and the Wall Street and, and real estate elite. Um, you know, but you know, if you go look at Yang's policies again, you know, his housing plan, it's I'm not as I'm not I'm I'm okay with kind of a more Yimby approach in that if you're not going to do anything remotely socialistic, you might as well try to build a bit. And and if if we're gonna upzone, at least upzone wealthy areas and I hope he'll do that. I mean, knowing how politics works in New York, he'll get scared and run away from that. But I would love to upzone some like wealthy neighborhoods and build more housing. Okay, there. I, I, I want to get to this point, but I mean, I do want to move on to to talk about Albany. But about you know, really quickly, you know, this is a question that's been in the back of my head over the uh, you know course of this great housing conversation that we're having. Does I mean, so you know, we have the lefty candidates, we have the Yimby candidates, you know, Yang. The cop, the Wall Street guy, the guy who's friends with Obama, and the rest. And, it's, awesome. it's a great summary. And uh, my, I mean, my question to everyone here is, does New York need more housing stock, period? Probably, Say yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It does. Yeah. There's 92,000 homeless people in our state. So, yeah. yes. The answer is yes. And the, well, under what model should you know, we be improving our housing stock? I mean, I think that what we should be doing is, I think we should be taking distressed existing housing that's either physically distressed or financially distressed, taking it over either through eminent domain or through purchasing it um, and converting it to deeply affordable housing that is democratically controlled through mechanisms like community land trusts, mutual housing associations, or even as public housing. Um, in addition to that, we need strong tenant protections to protect against displacement and speculation, but we also need to increase density in parts of the city that can handle it. And to do that, you need land. I've heard people argue that there's more vacancies than homeless people. Like, to what extent is that viable? I mean, kind obviously a lot of these vacancies people. are very wealthy people mm-hmm. who've bought these yeah, you know, penthouse apartments so, that they use for vacations for mo- one month a year. And another follow for me, which parts of the city? So on the vacancy question, yes, there are a, there is vacant housing. That's sort of like what I mean around like the underutilized housing. That's like sort of the first step, like to the extent that like there's two types of vacant apartments. There's like vacant apartments that are like vacant because they're uninhabitable because developers are just like holding them vacant to like get out existing tenants and raise up the rents. That's happening probably less than it used to, but it is happening. Um, And then there's also vacant apartments that are actually occupied because someone owns them, but that's just where they're keeping their money (laughs) and they actually like don't live there, but it's owned by someone. And so it will show up as like owned. Um, So I think those Two things. Um, And then when it comes to like increasing density, I think places like Forest Hills, I think places like parts of South Brooklyn, I think places like- Upzone my neighborhood. I'm not running for office. I can say that now. (laughs) Do it. Um, And, you know, parts of like, you know, Upper East Side, Upper West Side, parts that are like parts of the Bronx. Um, I I, I want to get parts of Queens. I, I want to get Zoran's take on this, but I just want to give my personal proposal. You know the '67 World's Fairgrounds I by Flushing. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. You know with yes. those the, 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 Don't say it. the decaying monuments to a like a weird Six, kind of Googie version of the '64 World's Fair. Thank you. Uh, I think that should become a you know a huge social housing development that they should keep all the decaying sixty four World's Fair shit there. <laughs> what uh, about the Trump golf course? People have talked about that before. Too. Is that the one where you go over the bridge to the to the Bronx? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. get rid of that yeah. shit. That is awful. Mm-hmm. Also, is, I, yeah. I I live near a useless army base that could be a beautiful park or massive housing development that is just a useless army base. So. There's a lot of like state owned hospitals too that are like potential increased density. Uh, Zoran, why don't you jump in there? 
Yeah, I think I, I wanted to just say that there's um, we also have to make sure that whatever we build, I think, has, has serious controls on it because the issue with housing, and this is a gross simplification, but it's that it, it isn't just supply and demand for the act of living in a, in a property, but it's that yeah. there's nothing to stop New York City from continuing to be from our housing to continuing to be bank accounts for investors across the world. So we have to ensure that the properties that we do build do not just serve that same purpose. And I think that that comes with serious controls on them. Um, I think additionally, there's also this tough thing, which is that so much of the brutality in our city is within the bureaucracy and like the banality of, of existing legislation and what I mean by that, specific to this conversation, is that there are so many fines that the de Blasio mayorality could be collecting on exploitative landlords that they choose not to enforce. There are so many things that enforcement just isn't a high priority and money is actually left in the table. I'm not saying that this money itself is like billions of dollars that would remake the city, but we have penalties that are already in law that are not really being enforced, and that's a cho- that's a choice that's being made. And it's not a sexy thing to build a mayoral you know a mayoral campaign around that like I'll take existing legislation and I'll <laughs> and I'll do it. But that is also part of what will change the tone of what's acceptable in our city and what's not. I, I want to shift gears on this conversation, but you know we've been spending all this time talking about the mayor's race and New York City specific issues. But Zoran, you are entering your fifth month fourth month yeah. in the uh, New York State Assembly. Last time we met you, you were you know, a million miles away from there, but now you've been in the thick of it in one of the most probably fascinating legislative sessions, I would think, in recent memory. Obviously, the Cuomo allegations yeah. hit. Uh, there's Cuomo's bungled response to COVID. And there are, and you have been joined by the, you know, largest, uh, you know, caucus of socialists uh, that I would imagine have been in the state legislature in New York uh, state history. So my question to you is, what the hell have you done for me? <laughs> what's what's going well, on first, there? For, first, I have to correct. We're the largest group since 100 years when the socialist legislators were expelled from Albany. So hmm. our, our first goal was to simply not be expelled. And I think that's going pretty well. All right. Although check, I'm never check, quite sure. Of, one promise yeah, kept. One. Done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, still here. Eight weeks to go. Yeah, eight weeks. I... Every time leader, any leader texts me to talk, I'm terrified that I might have to uncheck that box. But um, I think in terms of what we're doing, I mean, there has the, the fight in the budget was was an extremely intense battle that we had. And what was really difficult for me and for many of us is that that fight, if you look at it in the context of Albany, in the context of the last few years, even decades, frankly, the modern history of these chambers – resulted in monumental victories, right? We're talking about a fund specifically for undocumented New Yorkers. Mm. We're talking about raising revenue that is many times what would ever be conceived as possible. Um, we're talking about you know a housing package that has self-attestation where tenants just have to attest, attest themselves that they are eligible, right? Things that make these things accessible. We're talking about fully funding foundation aid over three years, which is money that is owed disproportionately to black and brown schools across New York State. And it was a court order that Cuomo refused to enforce for many years. Those are monumental victories. What's difficult is that myself and so many other socialists are coming into this body, not living and breathing the history of Albany as a context by which to understand whether something is monumental or not, but coming from our districts where the needs are just like a tsunami. And when you go through this budget process, you see at different points how you could have so much more than that which you end with. And that it's all political calculations and will about what is actually deemed acceptable. So when I go through the different things that I say are monumental victories, in each one of them, like in the Excluded Workers Fund, initially it it was also for formerly incarcerated New Yorkers. Then that was taken out, right? In the it, So the conservatives would have something. Then – the conservatives wanted more. So they put a 5% tax on all of the people who would receive money from this fund, right? Then they changed the eligibility such that it would be more strict in terms of who would get the most amount of money and who would get the second tier. Similarly to revenue, we were talking about $50 billion. Then we came down to $7 billion, which was very, very difficult to do for us to accept, but it's still markedly higher, right, than what we've been seeing before. 
from 7 billion to come down to 4.5, 4.3 rather, with the bulk of that being revenues that will sunset in the next three to four years, is a compromise that was too much to stomach. And so this is part of the this is less like political and more of like a personal reflection that it's really hard to say something, believe that thing, not win exactly that thing, and then come out into the world and everybody's congratulating you. And you're like, what for? You know, like, yes, yes, this is good. This is really good. But you were with me when I said that this wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. And obviously people who are listening, if they're, you know, really living in the weeds of New York politics will know that I and my other socialist comrades voted yes on this budget. And that's its whole other story because we had all prepared to vote no. Two of us had spoken in the chambers that we were voting no. I had written a speech to vote no. And then we got calls from advocates, colleagues, leadership saying that if you vote no on this, then all of the moderates, the conservatives that I've bought and bullied into voting yes on this bill will not vote yes, and then what you think is insufficient is not even going to happen at all. And so are you willing to risk a fund that you thought should have been 3.5 and now it's 2.1? Are you willing to risk that being zero? So that's, I mean, that's a whole different, you know. Yeah, that's a very interesting question because to what extent can you tell if that's a bluff? I know. You know, know? that's and the ga- That's the game. That's And, and that for, for, for me and for all of us, it was the first true experience of power in its raw form and and really reminded us that the numbers we have are simply insufficient because we cannot – they will never tell us the decision is easy. It is in their interest to always make it difficult and we have to be able to know and predict that this is what would happen. How but have frankly – how- and that's – sorry. How have the power dynamics changed now that Cuomo has been bruised? You know they've they've definitely changed in that he's he's desperate for good publicity. He's desperate for anything to distract from the avalanche of accusations and allegations, which range from harassment to assault to toxic workplace to that's just in the realm of of, um, the personal. of talking about sexual harassment, right? The personal yeah. abuse of office with regards to the political in the public sphere. We're talking about a bridge that might collapse. We're talking about a nursing home scandal where there's systematic undercounting and then obfuscating and then lying. Yeah. I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? It's kind of like spin spin the wheel, like Wheel of Fortune with Cuomo. Like you just pick your issue and you can find a scandal with this man. But the the issue is, so so with that, I think that's a big part of the reason why the way in which New York legalized marijuana was much closer to the legislature's proposal than the governor's proposal. And now that's again in the weeds, but for those who don't know, the governor had a proposal called CRTA. The legislature had a proposal called MRTA. The governor's proposal had new felonies. It allowed for the police to stop you on the premise of the odor of your vehicle. Yeah. You know, all, all these kinds of very punitive ways to legalize versus the legislature's approach, which did not have those things and also had stipulations as to that money would go to communities that were disproportionately impacted from the criminalization. All of these mm-hmm. kinds of, you know, looking at it as a justice framework. Yeah. So Cuomo gives a lot back in the final bill, I think, because of the pressure he's under and the desire to have that victory of legalized marijuana. I think similarly, you can see it with like him increasing indoor capacity, him shortening the shutdown of the subway. Him, you know, they're all, it's almost like clockwork. It's like some accusation comes out and then it's like a, by the way, everybody's getting vaccines. And it's like, uh, okay. And then all my friends who don't care about politics only get one takeaway from the day. Hmm. You know, just, oh, now I'm eligible. So is my mom. It's not like, oh, there was a 12th allegation that came out. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, and he's, he's a master of communication and obfuscation, which makes him a great politician. Um, Speaking, speaking of COVID, we haven't actually touched on it much. Uh, and I know we just have a couple of minutes, but is there anything we should know about New York's COVID response that is relevant as we're considering these mayoral candidates in particular, or more broadly? I know there was a lot of conversation about eviction moratoriums, et cetera, last year. Where are we now and what should the left be focused on in terms of a continued advocacy since apparently Cuomo is in a generous mood because of his personal predicament. 
Well, I mean, I feel like this is a topic of its own podcast. This yeah, is what sorry. we talk about. <laughs> you got three totally minutes. Fine. It's like, let's go through legislative priorities. What do you think about COVID? <laughs> Good, bad. Um, I would say very quickly, legislative priorities in New York State, the New York Health Act, single-payer health care across our state, right? We have a Democratic supermajority across the entire legislature and a Democrat in name governor. We have... Good cause eviction, which Wait, speaks to love. Okay, Sorry. I can't make you. St- oh, you're right. This is a whole podcast. Okay, we'll we'll come back to that. Sorry, go ahead, keep going. Because I'm like, what the dickens? But you know what? Medicare for all for another day. All right. Sorry. Um, then we have good cause eviction, which would create an additional tenant protection for many who are unprotected because they rent through the market. Uh, basically, it would create guidelines so that landlords could not raise rents above a certain amount. Right now, it's tied to like an inflation index. So we'd be talking about like three percent rent increases for people who live. Um, in in market rate housing, everyone, with the exception of, you know, live in property owners of one to four units, um, and and then I think another really big you know priority is is criminal justice um, across so many different levels. We're talking about parole justice, we're talking about I mean, generally, we, cash bail is an abomination, and we still have that on the books mm-hmm. here. There isn't a large movement to do so because of how kind of chastened everyone was by the fight two years ago where there was an immense backlash. And then I think with COVID, um, there's still like the racialized distribution of the vaccine and the fact that we have to get extremely, we, we have to create different models of distribution that actually reach different people. And it's not, you know, just on the internet or whatever it may be, because there's still just a massive gaps between white vaccination rates and black rates and Latino rates. And the thing is talking about criminal justice, and talking about Cuomo, it's that Cuomo had to be forced by a court order to vaccinate incarcerated New Yorkers. Jesus. And, and I was in a legislative meeting with Cuomo's right hand, Larry Schwartz, who told all of us that in category 1B, corrections officers and incarcerated New Yorkers would receive the vaccine. And then later that day, he told the Republican Senate minority that that was not the case and he, he had never, you know, that is not what's going to be the policy. And then since then, it did not happen until a lot of these legal aid societies and and defenders groups sued the governor and won that case. And since then, vaccinations have been have been started to be distributed within. Um, But I went to Rikers about a month ago and a lot of people had received their vaccine, but there were still individuals who said to me, I haven't gotten mine yet and I've been asking for it. And because we were there, he got his vaccine later that day. But you can't. That's not a system that can be scaled. Yeah. Yeah, See, what what should we know about? Um, what should we be keeping our eye on, rather, in terms of housing rights in COVID? Zoran and his comrades just extended the um, eviction moratorium, which is the strongest in the country, um, to August 31st. We are waiting on the governor to sign it, and he has not. Um, The eviction moratorium has been fascinating because the backlash against it is severe. And so, like, everyone is showing themselves. Like, everyone's, like, deep, deep commitment to property rights and that like deep seated ideology is like really showing up. And like the people who like reply on Twitter on behalf of landlords who aren't even landlords, it's just like (laughs) brutal. Um, They could be landlords someday, Sia. That's the dream. They want to be landlords. (laughs) I don't know. They're psychos. They're so mean. You mean like the, you like the Yimmy oh, dive? I forgot to note that Dan Morales is a landlord. It's like a, maybe that's part of my oh, reflexive. Yeah. 2K, 2K no, a month on, no. on, a, on a brownstone to someone. More than I pay in rent. Yeah, so, no, no, but they like, the, there are, people are just like obsessed with the narrative of the bad tenant. Like every tenant is like um, a drug dealer who's like going out and buying a, a new car every day and every homeowner is like a poor deserving hard worker <laughs> working class like it's it's nuts anyway but despite that we won an eviction moratorium till august 31st which means we have now officially kept courts in new york state closed for i don't know march 2020 till august 2021 which is tremendous um we got like a moderate amount of rent relief not cancel rent but rent relief um from the federal government really not from the state government at all um so that's gonna pay back rent for some folks it's not the amount that people need um and it won't do anything to transform this relationship between landlords and tenants which is what we so vitally need to transform Hmm. um and because jobs haven't come back what is going to happen if we don't change paths here 
is that we are going to see a lot of rental buildings, um, by some estimates, a million tenants, um, living in rental buildings that are facing foreclosure, which means they will be sold um, to someone else. And they could be sold to the city, the like the city or the state could step in and take them over and convert them to social housing, or they mm. could be sold to a private equity company. So I think, you know, without changes, we're headed towards something not maybe as dire as like the, um, as the housing crisis of 2008, 2009, 2010, when what the government did was bail out the banks and not really homeowners. And we saw like a massive consolidation of property. Or we could go a different path um, and buy up some buildings ourselves and, you know, bring more more property into the hands of the people. Um, so that's what we are fighting for. Thank you for that. That's helpful to keep be able to keep our eye on the prize. Ross, we would be remiss if we didn't bring up the fact that you have a book coming out. About- June 22nd, primary day, was not my decision, but that's when it's coming out. Uh, and it's about, oh my God, it's about Andrew Cuomo. It's about, yes. Uh, so yes, I wrote a book. Um, it is about Andrew Cuomo and you know his, his history in the state, but really his response to COVID and how terrible it was. And so, you know, as this crisis recedes and, you know, as, as attention, you know, moves toward other things, I think it's very important to remember how the narrative of Cuomo, the COVID conqueror, was so horribly off base. And in fact, New York has America's second highest death toll, second highest death rate. Cuomo from the very beginnings was downplaying the threat of COVID. He was very late to shut down New York City and actually rejected the idea of a shelter in place order uh, because Bill de Blasio suggested it. Uh, He horribly mismanaged nursing homes. He horribly mismanaged hospitals and underfunded them. He uh, quietly implemented a regime of austerity throughout 2020 that was rectified with the stimulus money, but in in the interim caused a lot of suffering and pain, particularly at uh, CUNY, the City University of New York, and and with a lot of social services as well. And as Sia knows, he has a pretty bad record with tenants as well. So this is a book that I hope will be a real uh, corrective to this false narrative that Cuomo handled COVID well, this false narrative that Cuomo is a good Democrat, you know, which still exists among many Democrats who vote. Um, and so I, I think it'll be interesting, uh, you know, to people who are interested in, in, in the response uh, and in also the history of Cuomo as a political figure and I kind of intertwine the, those elements. And did you start writing this book at the height of his popularity, of his MSNBC sanctity, um, I did not. But I was I was covering him. I mean, I've covered Cuomo now since you know almost almost a decade. You know, since I was a local uh, reporter in Queens, and you know I was writing for the Nation a lot last year on Cuomo, uh, and I I was pretty early um, in my criticism of his COVID response. Like my first. A uh, critical article of Cuomo was around March 16th of 2020, and I did a piece in Columbia Journal's review and in The Nation not long after that. So I was writing these articles, you know, really throughout the year. Also, I started a Substack last year, so I, I was continuing that coverage you know, with my Substack. And uh, the pu- my publisher, uh, War Books, which is a very good progressive publisher, they approached me late last year about doing a book. So I, I wrote it fairly quickly. Um, luckily, um, I had a lot of material to work with because I had been reporting on this for many months. I did new interviews for it and new reporting as well, but I was able to synthesize the work I had done with the new reporting and you know create a, a succinct narrative um, of of the of the last year of kind of this this hellish uh, twenty twenty. And then I had to update the book in March. We, we actually to push. Uh, you know, hold, hold, stop the stop the presses briefly. I, I had to uh, update with all the sexual harassment allegations. Mm-hmm. So the book the book ends at around the beginning of March. Now we are in the publication phase. So I, I had to rewrite my introduction and rewrite my conclusion because initially, when I finished the book in December, my my somewhat morbid take was Cuomo failed, but he's going to get reelected, and mm-hmm. we're all going to have to deal with it. And that take had to be rewritten a few months later. This guy keeps making news. 
I don't know. I don't know how you can just write one book about him. It's tough. It's tough, especially. I mean, the amount of investigations into him really is remarkable. You know, attorney general investigation, you know, from the state, uh, a federal investigation from the U.S. attorney in the Eastern District, plus an impeachment inquiry in the state assembly. So Cuomo for now is floating in kind of this strange limbo period where his poll numbers are, are quite bad, but not bad enough. Um, and really, this all will come to head when the, the results of these investigations come out. But I do think he'll get, at this rate, a serious primary challenge next year if he chooses to run again. And he is sociopathic enough to do that. You know, there is so much more that we can talk about, but I feel like we're, <laughs> we're running out of time here. And I do, I do want to very quickly shout out your Substack, Ross. I think it is the best reporting from a left perspective, on this mayoral's ra- mayoral race right now, and where can where can people find that Substack? Thank you. Yeah, so so you, you can find my Substack. It's it's rossbarkin.substack.com. So just my name. Uh, you follow me on Twitter at Ross Barkin, and and my book it's published by War Books, O R Books. And so if you go to the website warbooks.com, you'll see it right at the front. You pre order, you get fifteen percent off. We're still in the pre order phase, so get that discount, order it. Pre-orders are important for, for writers, important for publishers. You want a lot of pre-orders, helps build hype for the book. So can people use a code? Do you don't need a code. You don't need a code. Can, we, need a code. We, well, can just, we give a discount? Because when Zizek came on the show, he was also published by OR Books. Yeah. And we got to everyone, do Everyone code. gets it. No, there's no code. Everyone, you order the website, anyone gets it Put in the right code now. for fun. <laughs> Maybe you could put in a code for fun. I don't know what would happen, but you, you could make up a code and, and pretend they gave you one. Yeah. That you're here first, folks. Use code bad faith. Get fifteen percent off Do Ross's it. book at OR Books. Link in the description of this episode. Sia, where can people find you? I am on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Sia Weaver, C E A. My last name is Weaver. Um and you know, you can check out our website to follow us in the housing movement in New York. It's housingjusticeforall.org. And yeah. Reach out, organize your building, come to a DSA housing meeting, and I'm definitely going to be there. Housingjusticeforall.org, and a link in the description of this episode. Uh, Assemblyman Mamdani, thank you so much for joining us. You are uh, very, very welcome. It's always a pleasure. Can't wait to have you back on the show. Uh, where can people find you, Albany? You, yeah, you can find me in Albany four days a week, Astoria the rest of the week. Um, you can find me, my handle is Zahran K. Mamdani, and that first name is spelled Z-O-H-R-A-N, um, for those who are wondering. And you can also find me at most DSA events. I, I would be remiss if I did not plug our New York City chapter and the work we are doing. And I know we've talked a lot about the mayoral campaign, but June 22nd is also election day for the city council races. And there are six candidates that I'm immensely excited about. They are in the Bronx, they are in Queens, they are in Brooklyn. And those are people who deserve your time and energy. So check them out, DSA for the City. Thank you so much. 